to uh, to. Okay, um, that Tina and I made, and um, it really was uh, just a fluke that I found this um, organization that was formed about seven years ago uh, called uh, the Andes Amazon Fund and the Amazon Conservation Fund. And there's more about that story uh, as the slideshow progresses, but basically it was just by doing a internet search that I found out that these people had three research stations that went from the Andes uh, into the Amazon, and they were just getting into the ecotourism uh, operation. They're primarily for uh, ecologists to do research at. And so they put together a, uh, an itinerary for us over 21 days. And um, we had a guide and a driver. And uh, it, it was just Tina and I, we were the only two people on this. And it was an incredible experience. And I'd like to share that with you now. So we're basically flying from Lima into Cusco. And uh, here's, here's uh, the map of Peru. Lima's in the north, Cusco's down in the south. And uh, so we went from Cusco here into the first research station, which is the Huequecha Cloud Forest Station. And um, the first part of the talk tonight will be um, the time that we spent just outside of Cusco on the way to Huequecha. So um, this is... Uh, a small lake that is basically a reedy mat right now uh, called Huacarpe, and it's uh, just outside of uh, the capital city of Cusco. And I said to our guide, I had the, the uh, opportunity to list some of our interests, and we said we'd like to uh, take in a lot of history and uh, a lot of the cuisine as well of the area. So our first birding destination is a, is a pre-Inca village here in the foothills of the Andes at uh, Huaycarpi Lake. Um, doesn't seem to want to advance now for some reason. There we go. Temperamental. So this is the village uh, that was settled uh, before the time of the Incas. And uh, they, uh, they fished in the lake and uh, got a lot of their tubers and crops from the lake. And behind on the way on the hills, those are the terraces that um, they used to, uh, to grow their crops, potatoes. And um, they also had an aqueduct system coming down from the foothills of the Andes um, to water the crops that they were growing in these hills. And the first bird that our guide put us onto was this uh, Aplumbius rail. And we actually got to see a pair um, and the male was displaying to the female. We're familiar with this bird, a common gallinule. Uh, in the meadows here um, of Huacarpe is a, a band-tailed seed eater. Mm. And one of the interesting birds in this region uh, is a giant hummingbird. And this, this bird is almost the size of a starling. And oh. uh, it's the largest, the largest hummingbird. This is a, a puna teal. That's a, an endemic to, uh, to Peru. And so is this bird. This is an Andean coot. Uh, they're quite a bit bigger than the coots we have up here. You can see by that, uh, the no nonsense bill. Uh, we made our way to the village of uh, Pilahuata, which is um, at an elevation of around 8,300 feet. And um, mostly subsistence living here. These people are farming in the, in the areas outside their village. Uh, that's our van at the bottom of the street there and Tina and Percy. And uh, this is an interesting um, sculpture garden that they had in the, in the center of the village in the square of the, uh, the interaction with the conquistadors and the, uh, the indigenous people at the time. And again, these, the roofs on these houses, this, is, this would be Spanish colonial uh, circa 
especially this building here. And people wearing uh, traditional costumes. So on the way out of uh, Pircahuata to, um, to our first way station, Cusco, uh, Wequecha, we stopped off and had lunch in the Andes. And um, I just, I wanted to point out those terraces on the other side of that mountainside. This is the extent of agriculture that the Incas had mastered before the conquistadors got there. And none of this, they don't have uh, beasts of burden. The Incas didn't have anything to pull a plow. They have llamas, they can carry things, but they don't have anything that'll pull a plow. And so all of these terraces were tilled with uh, a foot plow that an individual would, would operate. And they're still growing the same way. But the, you know, the, the level of uh, the extensive network of agricultural products that were grown here on the side of these hills that had death-defying slopes to them is just phenomenal. Uh, this is the, the next village of Paucartambo. And uh, some of the crops that the women are selling at the market stall here, the long grasses, that's actually food for um, guinea pigs, which is a very popular food item in, in Peru. They're called cuy. And um, this is a, the, uh, the Cosnipata River that runs through through Paucartambo. And this is sort of where civilization ends uh, as you go into the Andes and start climbing up. Um, this is a Spanish colonial bridge that's still functional in the town. And this is an Inca building uh, that's still in the town. Just sort of part of the, uh, part of the landscape now. Uh, this is a familiar looking bird to us. This is an Andean flicker. And um, in these uh, high elevation villages, the houses are made of adobe and the flickers hammer their nests into the side of the house because there's no trees that far up. And so they nest in the side of the houses and people don't seem to mind it too much. So we are now up into the cloud forest of the Waiketcha Biological Station and looking down over the lowlands of the valley. Ahead of us there is the, uh, the river that we would eventually be going down into the Amazon basin, uh, the Madre de Dios River. Um, the road that we take is uh, one of the most infamous roads in the world. It's called the Manu Road. It's the only road from that last village I told you about, Pocartambo. Uh, and it ends at the end of the road in Atalaya. Uh, and from there, it's all river traffic in, in the Amazon basin. Um, this road is a one lane road that's used by two lanes of traffic, including uh, logging trucks and gravel trucks. There are no barriers and it's a 2000 foot drop uh, down the side of the mountain. So um, they used to have a rule where the traffic would go in one direction one day and another direction the other day and that got abandoned um, fairly quickly. So it was just uh, devil may care for the trip, but it added a certain element of excitement to it. Uh, this is looking down over the side of the road into the, um, the Cosnipata Valley. And uh, we were here on the top of this, looking down into these grasslands, looking for spectacled bear, which we unfortunately didn't get to see, but um, this is uh, the Cosnipata Valley, the cloud forest of the Andes. Uh, and the river down below Tina. Um, memorize this view. So uh, there are, because of the, the elevation in Peru and Ecuador, you have the opportunity to have very, very many bio ecosystems and, and biomes. And it's created one of the most biodiverse places on earth. Uh, because of the elevation, because of the rainfall and the patterns in moisture precipitation, you essentially get um, a, a great stratification of um, 
of food niches and you get very specialized uh, groups of birds. And because fruit is available all year round in uh, places like Peru, you have increased specialization in, in fruit eaters. Uh, you also have specialization in insect eaters as well. So it's this great adaptive radiation that's happened. And one of the groups of birds down there that we don't have up here because we don't have year round fruit are the Katingas. And uh, this is a member of the Kotinga family. This is uh, a barred fruit eater. Um, not a very imaginative name, but uh, that basically describes what it does. Uh, this is a crimson-backed woodpecker. Um, one of the first birds we saw at the, uh, at the research station. This is the same, same species, but from the back, as you can see why it gets its name. Uh, another group of chicken-like birds that they have down in from Mexico down through uh, Central South America are the chachalacas and, uh, and the guans, which are both in the, in the same family. Uh, this is an Andean guan. And whenever you see birds like this, you know that you're in a pretty good ecosystem away from human disturbance because they're very heavily hunted for food. They were. The cloud forest is where we first uh, come into some of the incredible diversity of hummingbirds that exist, um, surprisingly more so in the cloud forest than in the Amazon. There are more species of hummingbirds in, in mid to high elevation than in the Amazon. And this one is called a long-tailed sylph. Uh, I think the, the people who discovered and named hummingbirds must have been contemporaries of Yeats and the romantic writers of the day because they all have such beautiful poetic names to them. Uh, so hummingbirds are essential pollinators of the flowers in, in tropical ecosystems. And their, their beaks generally reflect the kind of flowers that they feed on. This is... Um, a group of birds, this is a species in a group of birds that are actually um, short circuiters of uh, pollinating flowers. They are called flower piercers and they bypass the stamens of a plant when they get nectar by using that tiny little hook on the end of their beak and cutting a hole at the base of the plant where the nectar is. So they will steal the, the, uh, the nectar from the flowers that they, that they inhabit. Uh, so this is a masked flower piercer, or mustached, sorry, mustached. This is a masked flower piercer. Uh, my wife, Tina, has no fear of heights. And uh, this is a, uh, the tallest suspension bridge, I believe, in, uh, if not Peru, then maybe even South America that we went on. It's the longest suspension bridge for, for scientific research that they've installed. And so we went out on this to look at the canopy of a cloud forest. And we were about 150 feet up uh, in this um, incredible network of, uh, of uh, suspension bridges. Um, we were hoping to see some birds at eye level, but um, uh, that day, they, they weren't cooperating, but we still had an incredible uh, trip to it. Another one, of the, uh, another one of the hummingbirds at high elevation here is the uh, amethyst, amethyst throated sun angel. And uh, what you find with a lot of these high elevation hummingbirds, the, the giant hummingbird as well, is that the air is so thin that um, it becomes energetically expensive for them to hover. And so a lot of these highland species will actually just um, perch and feed. Like this one here is just kind of hanging onto the leaf of the plant and, and uh, feeding from it rather than hovering. Uh, this is a amethyst throated sun angel in full sunlight. So you really get to see why it, why it gets its name. This is a, uh, one of many poisonous caterpillars that we were to encounter on this trip. And uh, that's my hand for size comparison. I want you to look at the clumps of lichen in the top left of the picture, of uh, the mosses, sorry. 
and look at the pattern on this caterpillar. What a brilliant, brilliant piece of camouflage. But those spines will deliver uh, days of unending pain should you decide to uh, touch it. Here's another one of the high elevation hummingbirds. This is a Tyrian metal tail. Uh, head on. They have a beautiful iridescent uh, bluish tail, hence the name. This is a, uh, a violet throated star frontlet. Again, one of those fabulous names bigger than the bird itself. Of course, the cloud forest is uh, perhaps best characterized by the amount of epiphytes and bromeliads and uh, and tank bromeliads that grow there because the air is at 100% humidity. There are clouds going through all the time. There's moisture everywhere. And indeed, in some places, the, the biomass of these parasitic and epiphytic plants can account for almost 60% of the biomass in a tropical uh, mountain cloud forest. Um, and there are animals that have completely evolved life strategies around these tank bromeliads and orchids. This was a place of hundreds and hundreds of species of orchids and our guide knew very many of them. Mot Mots is another, another group of birds we see from Mexico South and they reach uh, probably their pinnacle of uh, radiation speciation in um, Peru, Ecuador. This is an Andean Mot Mot. And they're quite big birds. Um, I would say that'd be about uh, maybe 20 inches. And the, uh, their tail, they're characteristically, almost all the mot mot species, they'll uh, pass their tail back and forth almost like a pendulum. If you wanna find out where somebody's gone pee on the Manu Road, just look for the butterflies. The um, salt is a very precious commodity in tropical ecosystems. The, the soil is very salt poor. And so if anyone's uh, or any animal has gone to the bathroom by the side of the road, the butterflies gather there for the, uh, for the salts, for the ammonium and potassium. Uh, fly catchers, boy oh boy. Peru is um, a land of fly catchers. I don't know, they, they probably got 170 species of flycatchers there. Uh, this one is a cinnamon flycatcher. And uh, just look at all the, the moss and lichen on, on the trees there. Another group of birds that uh, we don't get up here, but uh, occur down there are the, uh, the trogons. This is the family that the uh, resplendent quetzal from Costa Rica, uh, in that Central America area is uh, part of the family of. And they are um, primarily fruit eaters, uh, especially quetzals. They'll eat, um, they primarily eat wild avocados, uh, aguacatillos, they call them. But when they're feeding young, they need more protein and they switch to an insectivorous diet then. But all the trogons are what's called um, stall feeders. So they they swoop down from above, uh, above their target berry, and then at the very last minute, they'll use their tail and wing feathers to break and form sort of a J loop upwards and stall and then pluck the berry off the branch. They don't have very strong feet for perching like a toucan does, and so they, they fly to feed instead. And this is the back of the, um, this is a golden, golden headed quetzal. The first uh, photograph was a female and this is a male. A golden olive woodpecker, uh, slightly uh, lower elevation than the crimson back woodpecker now. And the green jay, uh, I think that uh, they were dividing these up into separate species, but I think now they're, they're calling it a complex all the way from Peru to Texas. Uh, this is a bird that I'd hoped to see, but I'd hoped to see uh, a male. Um, but I'll take this one. This is a female lyre-tailed nightjar. And the male possesses 
tail feathers that are about two feet long, uh, huge long pennants. And this one was uh, roosting on the lodge of uh, the roof of a lodge as uh, we were on our way to the next uh, lodge we were going to. This is a slide of the Manu Road. And um, just in the lower left corner, there's a flash of a butterfly, but um, we'd had a rain the night before and the sun came out the next day and there were literally thousands of morpho butterflies all flitting about in the valley below us. Um, it was a truly magical moment and um, one I'll never forget. These morphos are about the size of a cecropia moth. They're quite a size on them. And iridescent blue. Again, in the family, same family as Quetzals. These are trogons. This is a, a masked trogon. And you, you think, uh, you know, a bird that brightly colored and that beautiful would be, it'd be obvious to see it. But trogons usually face away from you when if they know people are about they will turn their back to you and that iridescence on their back is a really great disruptive camouflage they turn into sort of shapeshifters so until they turn to face you and they're not very active birds they don't they don't need to be because they're fruit eaters uh so they don't hop around like a warbler would um to, to find their food they can just they just sort of sit there and scan the trees scan the leaves looking for fruit and then swoop out and, and grab it. Uh, this is a, a species of birds. Again, they're, they're um, tree hunters and uh, wood creepers. Uh, they're, they're a family of birds that make their living by searching in these bromeliads and clusters of leaves. And because you have so much of these deadfalls and snags and uh, dead leaves worth poking into. You have a whole family of species that um, this is their life strategy. So um, these are montane foliage gleaners and that's pretty much describes what they do. They just go from branch to branch looking at orchids and clusters of bromeliads and poking around inside them uh, for insects. This is a uh, plumbius pigeon. And this was a, um, a white-throated hawk that had just launched itself in front of us off the road. Um, and it had found from across the road a tiny lizard that it snatched and brought back to this perch uh, to grab. So again, we're descending elevation. And um, there is a, a, a natural law called Humboldt's law uh, that basically says for every thousand feet you descend or ascend in a mountain in, in uh, South America, it's the equivalent of driving 300 miles south in terms of ecozones and climate. So, you know, we, we went from 12,000 feet to 1,000 feet. Um, and you can imagine the, the, the incredible change in diversity and landscape as you dropped elevation. And within an hour of driving down the Manu Road from Waiketcha, it was getting noticeably warmer and gradually you start seeing the, um, the trees aren't quite so lichen covered and moss covered and all of a sudden palm trees start creeping into the, uh, to the landscape. Uh, this is a roadside hawk, one, a very, very common raptor down in uh, Central and South America. Another one of these uh, flycatchers, this is a rufous-chested chat tyrant, a uh, very small, nervous flycatcher, always looking for prey and, and acting like a lot of flycatchers, just going out, grabbing, sallying out, grabbing an insect, coming back to a perch. Now, Peru and Ecuador are countries that have well over 100 species of tanagers. And again, they're elevationally uh, distributed. So up in the cloud forest, you get these, um, what are called bush tanagers, and um, you'll get whole mixed flocks of just tanagers and some flower piercers that will go through and come out of nowhere. And you could get 75 birds and, and two dozen different species of birds in that mixed species flock. And the idea is that 
you know, there, there's always a pair of eyes looking for a predator while the rest of them feed. And they're very, very high energy birds. Uh, they eat small fruits and seeds and some insects. This is a, this is a golden collared tanager. This is a hooded mountain tanager. Uh, this is a scarlet-breasted mountain tanager. This is all part of the same mixed species flock. This, even the guide said, wow, we're lucky to see this. This is a rust and yellow tanager. They only live in bamboo thickets in Peru. A tropical peewee looks a little bit in body shape like our peewees. One of my favorite species of birds, the families of birds, the barbets. And uh, my guide, when we arrived in Cusco, asked me, do you have um, a top list of birds that you'd like to see, target birds? And I gave him a list of five birds and the versicolored barbet was one of them. And uh, as it turned out, I found it and showed him <laughs> where it was when we were down there. Usually I get a, a shirt off the guide. If I find a bird he hasn't found, then I get his shirt. That's the deal. So this is a, an endemic to Peru, a versicolored barbet. Another one of the hummingbirds. This is the, uh, the violet, violet fronted brilliant. And up in the cloud forest, it's obviously it's colder, it's higher. So the, one of the primates there are woolly monkeys. They're quite big. And uh, obviously they've got that woolly coat to, to uh, protect them from the cold that's up there. And we happen to find a family group crossing uh, a tree uh, over the road. And more and more um, organizations, conservation organizations are, are string, stringing up uh, rope branches across roads so that monkeys and coatis and uh, sloths don't have to cross the road on the ground level. They can use the aerial bridge across the road. And it's proven uh, of great benefit to reducing road kills. One of the target birds that we wanted to see down there is this one, also in the Katinga family. This is the cock of the rock. And um, these are a lecking species. So you get uh, up to a dozen males in a display area and uh, they all just sort of hang out there. They take no part in raising the young, feeding the young, because uh, part of the reason is a, a bright orange and black bird would attract attention coming back to a nest with a mouthful of food. And also because the food is so available and abundant that his efforts aren't really needed. Um, and what has happened is that spare time, more or less, that they that the males have has been devoted to developing ornate plumage and, and dance maneuvers and these uh, highly ritualized dances that they go through. Any of these lecking species. Uh, the other thing that happens is tropical birds, whereas an average clutch size up here would be four eggs, down there it would be two. Because the chances that a snake will come along and wipe out the clutch down there are much greater than up in the northern climates. And so the birds don't invest as much in each single clutch. So they don't have as many to feed at once. So you end up with these incredible systems like mannequins and cotingas have that are highly ritualized because the males aren't really needed uh, around the nests to raise young. So there's, there's a, um, an incredible radiation of behaviors for, for breeding behavior down there. It's uh, for me, this was one of the iconic birds of uh, mid elevation cloud forest, still going down the Manu road eventually. Uh, we're now at the second biological research station called Villa Carmen, which was very kindly bought for Amazon conservation by Woody Harrelson, of all people. Um, so we're now at about 2000 feet elevation. We've just come out of the, the, um, the foothills of the Andes. Uh, and lo and behold, there's a willow flycatcher right off our back. This you know, it, it could have been one that I've seen in Hullet Marsh. 
uh, termites. Obviously, there are lots of different ants and termites in, in Peru. This is an interesting paper termite nest. You can see them all over the outside of the paper there. Uh, this is a, a caracara, um, which is, they're, they're in the falcon family, but they, they don't really behave like falcons. Um, we're probably most familiar with the crested caracaras that we see in Mexico, Costa Rica, the white caracara. Um, but down there, there's quite a few different species, and uh, they're all adapted to different elevations. And uh, interesting behavior on this one, this, uh, the black caracara. If you can see, he's on the back of this cow. And what he's doing is uh, picking the parasites off the back of this cow. It had some bot flies in it. And uh, he was making a meal of it. Uh, it's, it's quite a bit warmer now. The average temperature is probably about 80 degrees. This is a, a black fronted nun bird. Now you see things like bamboo and palms. Uh, again, in that uh, guan family. This is a blue-throated piping guan. And they are basically like arboreal turkeys. They're about the size of a turkey and uh, well adapted to just running along tree branches and feeding up there. A beautiful little hummingbird called a booted racket tail. And you can see they're, they're called booted because they've got little brown puffs um, on their legs, modified leg feathers. And some of the flowers that they'd be feeding on. Uh, down there we have brown capuchin monkeys. And uh, this was a group that was crossing the road right at our feet. And uh, really we were three, four feet away from them and uh, they didn't pay us a whole lot of attention. Except for that one. This is a, a dipper, a white cap dipper. And uh, another one of the birds I was hoping to see. I've been chasing these through Texas and Arizona and never saw one. And uh, my guide, of course, he knew where he could find a pair of burrowing owls. And what he told me was they've just crossed over the Andes and they're starting to colonize the, uh, the Madre de Dios rivers as new habitat. And what they're doing is um, because the river's so fast flowing and it's always washing trees away, there are, there are innumerable islands, small islands along the Madre de Dios. And these owls are colonizing these islands, and that's their own little patch, their own little territory. Uh, again, one of the more interesting and poisonous caterpillars uh, down there. This one, <laughs> this was about six inches long, and uh, apparently just incredibly venomous, like uh, fiberglass fibers being embedded into your hand and then searing white hot pokers for three days afterwards. Uh, some of the big uh, Campylophilus woodpeckers down there. This is the, uh, the crimson crested woodpecker. Sort of the same family as our pileated woodpecker. A bare-throated tiger heron. Anybody see the bird in this? The branch coming up and there's a little, looks like a feather covering its eye. This is a, a great potto. And I, I actually called the guide out on it and I said, because he stopped the car and he said, get out, I have something I want to show you. And I said, there is no way that you just saw that bird driving past in the van. He said, oh no, it's been on this branch for 10 years. 
You said, if it's not on this tree, it's on that one. <laughs> uh, hummingbird hawk moth. This little plant, boy, oh boy, this is a, it's an introduced plant from, from Costa Rica south, and it's in the mint family. It's called Stachytarfida franzei. And if ever, if ever there was a small hummingbird magnet plant, this is it. And I've seen it planted at research stations from Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Peru. And the, the, it, it just brings hummingbirds in like crazy. Bottom hand uh, of this screen is a jaguar track that wasn't there eight hours previous when Percy and I walked this trail. You can just see the paw prints at the very bottom in the center of the screen. This bird, uh, this bird has been, it was one of my five birds that I gave Percy the list of. And uh, it has been seen by exactly three people in the 20th century, 21st century, sorry, in Costa Rica and Panama. Uh, this is the lanceolated monklet. And Percy, we were, we were driving in the van he had the window down and all of a sudden he grabbed the driver and said, alto, alto. And he turned to me and he said, Anthony, I think I have one of your birds. And honestly, from about 700 feet down, he heard this tiny bird's call, which is about the size of a chickadee. And he called it back and a pair of them popped up. And I, I got to see them and take pictures of them for a half an hour. This is the bird that made me cry. It's uh. I've been looking for it forever from Costa Rica south. And uh, I know how hard it was to find this bird. And the, the, the driver wasn't a bird watcher. He, I don't think he'd ever done this before. He was wondering, what the hell is this grown man crying about a little tiny fluffy bird about? But um, it was very special to me. And I'll, I'll probably never see one again. Uh, a limpkin. Uh, uh, Long-tailed tyrant. These are great flycatchers of uh, open country. This is a, a metal mark butterfly. A swallowtail. Again at the Starkey Taffeta. This is a big uh, Caligo moth. And it's thought that the eye marking in the back is a uh, distraction away from the head end to uh, deflect a bird's uh, peck at it toward the eye instead of the, the head of the actual moth. Uh, massive, massive moth. They're the size of my hand. Not a very good picture, but a very good bird to get. This is a paradise tanager. Um, now at uh, mid elevation, you get different groups of tanagers associating. Uh, not so many mountain tanagers, but this is the um, their equivalent of a cardinal down there. Um, so this would be a red-capped cardinal. And again, Percy delivered on the third target species for me. Uh, again, a, a bird that's very rarely seen. There's not very many of them wherever they live. Uh, this is a red-throated caracara. And they primarily feed on wasp nests, tearing open paper wasp nests. They're incredibly noisy. Uh, but again, I was thrilled, thrilled to see one right above me in the tree. Uh, aptly named, this is a speckled hummingbird. And there's one at a Starkey Taffeta. Uh, this is the back end of a, uh, a golden-tailed sapphire, another small hummingbird. This is a female rufous-crested co coquette, a tiny, tiny uh, family, among the smallest hummingbirds of coquettes. And that's the male. This is a, a female thorn, thorn tail. Wire crested thorntail. Uh, this is a violet fronted brilliant, aptly named, I think. And oropendulas down there. They're about the size of crows and um, 
their, their vocalizations are really interesting because when they start calling, they do a somersault around the branch when they're, when they're, they're giving their display calls. They're colonial nesters. They have these big uh, pendulous nests that they, they'll put together in a colony in trees. If they can, they'll do it over water for more protection. They've learned recently to do it close to dwellings and houses so that uh, people keep the predators away. And they're also uh, fond of, of uh, locating a nest site near a wasp nest. Yeah, he's just about to launch into his song there. Uh, we went into an indigenous village um, just outside of uh, Via Carmen. This, this village was uh, part of the Machagenga tribe, and uh, this was a shaman's hut. Um, so we went in and um, we watched them uh, make traditional uh, spears and uh, darts for blowguns and, um, and weaving. Uh, pretty fascinating to see them do this. And uh, towards the end of the demonstration, uh, over the top of the hut came down a very large and very venomous spider that one of the gentlemen just took the spear that he'd made and basically just launched it at this spider and took it out of commission. So uh, they work, they work. There's a social flycatcher. And this pattern, this brown, white stripe over the head, yellow belly, is a variation on a theme all through Central and South America on flycatchers from the Kiskadee, boatbill flycatcher, you know, tropical kingbird. This is uh, again in the tree runner family, um, similar to wood creepers here in terms of behavior. This is a street xenops. And uh, one of the interesting primates down there are these three striped night monkeys, nocturnal primates. sleeping the day away. Again, a very small, uh, this is a wire crested thorn tail. So now we're gonna go uh, to the last leg of our uh, journey. Uh, we're going to where the road ends at Atalaya and getting on a motorized canoe. Again, some more thorn tails, that's the male. Uh, So-called because of the tail is just like modified wires out of the back of it. So this is uh, Atalaya, pulling into Atalaya. And ahead of us is the Madre de Dios River that comes out of the, uh, the foothills of the Andes and makes its way eventually to join the Amazon. You can see all these bars and islands ahead of us. And when we first got into the canoe, you couldn't hear yourself talk for all the gravel that was being washed underneath your boat. And, uh, banging up against the side of the boat. There is such a volume of sediment that's coming down from the mountains. And this was our, uh, this was our first, our journey into the Amazon. We rounded the bend. We'd been on the, on the river for, I think about four or five hours. And this, for some reason, this landscape twigged something in me. And I said to Tina, I don't know why, but I feel like I've seen this before. My guide hadn't heard me say that, but he grabbed my shoulder and he said, so this is the part of the river where an uncontacted tribe uh, walked out of Manu Biosphere Park, uh, where those mountains are, and crossed the river and uh, raided a, a small settlement. And it was caught on camera and the subject of a documentary. And I said, I just finished watching that documentary. It was called um, First Contact. And the tribe were the Mashkupiru. And there happened to be an anthropologist on the shore of that settlement when this uh, event occurred. And they did film it. And nobody could understand what the Mashkupiru was saying. They started grabbing machetes. They started grabbing t-shirts. They wanted clothes and, and machetes. And uh, they eventually managed to get a translator seven hours after a standoff and figure out what they were trying to say. They'd already left by that point. But um, since that event in 2016, 
the Mashku Piru have killed three people who tried to go in and um, assimilate them. Uh, they don't want to be assimilated. And this, um, I didn't take my this picture, but my friend who is the director of the OSA Conservation Research Station, which is affiliated with the Amazon Conservation uh, Organization, Andy Whitworth, he did the same trip as we did uh, a year later. And um, these are Mashku Piru from across the river. I find this incredible. I find it really heartening that there are still people that don't need our way of life. This is a capped heron, a crimson cap woodpecker. Look at the claws on that. Incredible adaptation. This is a, uh, a lodge on the way to the research station called Blanquillo Tambo. And this cliff is high in minerals. And because of that, it's a clay lick. And so they built a blind across a safe distance away from uh, from the, the cliff and we were the only two people in it um, and we just basically got there at 5 30 in the morning and um, watched this incredible spectacle unfold of thousands of parrots come uh, to feed these are uh, yellow crowned and mealy parrots and the theory is that they're uh, loading up on minerals because um, like I said the soils are are potassium and sodium poor. And so they're getting some of the minerals from these deposits that are higher than normal in minerals. There's another theory that the kaolin in the clay is coating their stomachs uh, to protect them from the toxins in the unripe palm fruits that they feed on. So on the, on the right-hand side are mealy parrots and on the left is a blue-headed parrot and a yellow crown Amazon. So there's a, there is a pecking order to this clay lick and the, the largest parrots went last. The macaws, they wanted to check out to see whether there were any predators around. And so they would let the parrotlets, the smallest ones, they would go in first and start feeding. And if it looked okay, then the next largest species would come in and start feeding and then so on up the ladder. But in the meantime, this was like, this was like their market. The, the amount of socialization and uh, mutual grooming and communication that was going on, you know, were they passing on information vocally to where the good feeding sites are? It was just uh, mind blowing to, to see the level of communication that was going on with these incredible birds. Uh, Blue headed parrots feeding on date palms. Blue and yellow macaws were there. Red and green macaws were there. Uh, the owner of the lodge was complaining because a jaguar was ruining her business by eating the macaws. <laughs> so um, business was poor because uh, the macaws weren't coming down to the clay licks. Uh, they knew what was hiding behind the bushes. A white-throated toucan. Beautiful, uh, tiny little primates, the marmosets uh, down in Costa Rica, or, or sorry, in Peru, uh, and tamarins. And they travel in highly social groups. They're about the size of a gray squirrel. And this is an emperor tamarin, so called because of that crazy Fu Manchu mustache he's got. And uh, a bit of a mystery bird. I think they're, they're putting them in with wrens. This is a black cap Donacobius. They're a bird of, uh, of swamps and oxbow lakes and very, very, very vocal, like the wrens down in tropical countries. An iconic bird of, of the Amazon. These are Huatzin. And this remarkable creature, uh, this is an Amazonian giant river otter. Uh, they only live in oxbow lakes, so you have to get off the main river to try and find them. And uh, they're, they're less, more people have seen jaguars than have seen Amazonian giant river otters. Uh, these 
are six feet long and they are the apex predator of uh, oxbow lakes. And they're led by a matriarch. And uh, I made a horrible error <laughs> in judgment. Uh, we were in a dugout canoe, essentially a, a hollowed out piece of wood, Tina, me and Percy, the guide, and heard a splash off in the lake. And sure enough, five heads pop up and it's the family of otters and uh, they're investigating who we were on the lake. And the matriarch started uh, barking and I made the stupid assumption that all otters are curious and playful. So I responded by imitating their bark. And about 20 to 30 feet off the end of the dugout, my guide finally said, can you please stop making that noise? She's coming to attack us. And I've since seen videos of them grabbing jaguars by the back leg and trying to pull them in the water. And it was, uh, I'm so glad that Percy decided to uh, think better of it and let me know that I was committing a grievous gringo error. A greater yellow-headed vulture. One of the many species of heliconias. This is a bird, another one, like if you see guans, this is a, a trumpeter, a pale wing trumpeter. Uh, they're ground birds and um, overhunted. So the fact that we were seeing family groups in this area was a really good sign. Again, tiny, tiny little flycatchers. This is a toady, a toady flycatcher. Um, it is a yellow browed toady flycatcher and um, smaller, about just about the same size as a, maybe a kinglet, maybe even smaller than a kinglet. They're among the smallest passerines, um, stub little tail on them, really broad bill to grab tiny insects from underneath a leaf. And they basically launch out from a branch and pick insects from underneath the leaf. That's, uh, that's how they make their way. This is, uh, this is an ant you really wanna learn to identify if you're going into the, the moist tropical jungle because um, it can cause you a world of pain. This is uh, Paraponera clavata, also known as the bullet ant, because when it stings you, you feel like you've been shot uh, for up to 48 hours. They're almost an inch long. They're a very primitive ant, and uh, they really pack a punch. Uh, another group of very interesting birds are the jacamars. Um, again, uh, fantastic iridescent plumage on them. And uh, they're, they're primarily uh, butterfly and bee and wasp hunters with that long beak of theirs. They can uh, manage to handle these, the animals that have stingers or the animals that have big flapping wings uh, with a long beak like that, they can manage that kind of prey. So this is a white-throated jacamar. Parallel. Uh, sorry, these are white-throated jacamars. The others were uh, bluish-fronted. Jacamars. And another one of the, uh, the tamarins, uh, this is a uh, saddleback tamarin checking us out. And these are uh, dusky titi monkeys giving their morning call out to let everybody know where they are and where their territory is for the day. And a pair of uh, scarlet macaws came to visit us on my last day at the station. Um, so I want to end by showing you um, what I've done with that remarkable trip. Uh, and by saying that uh, when I got back, the coordinator for our trip, um, the Andes Amazon Fund is based in Washington, DC. She emailed me and, and she said, um, if you have any input or uh, comments, we'd like to hear it. And I said, well, I'm gonna try and publicize this trip as much as I can, but if you have an artist in residency program, I'd, I'd sure like to sign up for it. Uh, and then a week later, um, I get a call. So to give you context, when we got to the first 
uh, biological station, I saw that the founder of Amazon Conservation was a guy named Adrian Forsyth. And I recognized that name from my University of Guelph days. Uh, he was an author of Canadian mammal books. And I guess he turned into a tropical ecologist uh, in the meantime. So I recognized the name. So a week later from Washington, DC, I get a call from Adrian Forsyth. And um, he's seen some of the artwork I submitted to the coordinator. And uh, he said, uh, I definitely want you to come down as an artist in residence. Um, and I, I'm looking on your website for your farm and you're based in Sebringville, Ontario. I said, yes. He said, my ancestors were the original Sebrings. They cut down every tree in Sebringville and I've been trying to replant them ever since. <laughs> so Adrian and I have since become really good friends. Uh, Adrian and his co-founder Enrique have bought two of my paintings based on my trip. Uh, Adrian owns this one. It's a versicolored barbet uh, with a cecropia leaf in the background. And Enrique, uh, actually somebody from New York bought this one. This was that scarlet-bellied mountain tanager and the Cosnipata Valley underneath uh, where Tina was standing on the end of the road. And Enrique bought this one of the, uh, the rust and yellow tanager that I did. And it took me three months this last year, but I finally completed... Uh, my biggest painting to date, uh, three foot by five foot of Amazonian giant river otters uh, based on our encounter with them, uh, which is now hanging up in my studio. So that is uh, pretty much the, the trip. If anyone has any questions, I'm going to stop share. And we can get back to it. Good. <clears throat> amazing amazing trip amazing artwork wow oh thank you oh <laughs> uh, i wouldn't want to be pulled out of a canoe by one of those that's for sure no. <laughs> wow yeah. so you, yeah. you don't realize how uh, close you came until afterwards and then you oh, think, oh i yeah. i guess not, not um, do anyone have any questions uh, i guess we can unmute everyone can we yes i'll do that all right, good man. If I can figure out how. <laughs>